better. This in a way we'll, uh, we'll uh, turn it over. When I'm done here, I'll turn it over to Myra to read the statute for Bowser and five comments from EMR. At that time, I'll turn it over to Engineer. Uh, and after his presentation, we'll open it up to the board for questioning. And after that, we'll open it up to the public. And uh, any public that would like to speak would like to state your name for the record. So at this time, I'll uh, let Myra begin his long read here. Sorry about this, but I have to do this according to the statute. So, this is the advisory report uh, as given by the Board of Water and Soil Resources, dated November 17, 2017. Um, dear Watershed District Managers, on behalf of the Board of Soil and Water Resources, I offer this advisory report in accordance to Minnesota Statute 103D711, Subdivision 5, or 103D605, Subdivision 2, as applicable. This advisory review is for the preliminary engineer's report dated October 10, 2017. General comments. The preliminary engineer's report is generally easy to follow and appears to present detailed hydrology and hydraulic analysis and preliminary design concept for a practical plan. Subject to the following specific comments and recommendations. I'll characterize the plan presented in the report as advanced concept level. Uh, because it does not yet include subsurface geotechnical investigation and analysis for the under seepage of the embankment stability, erosion control, and structural design, secondary benefits design, or preliminary construction plan and specifications. The level of the detail of this advisory report corresponds to the preliminary engineer's report. The preliminary engineer's report and the transmittal letter do not identify how the project was formally initiated via 103D701 or section 103D605. It is recommended that further engineer's reports for this and other projects include information in that regard. Specific contract section, specific comments, section 1.1 background, page one. The text indicates that alternative A was selected to carry forward, but fi figure six selected alternatives appear to be hybrid of figure one. Alternative site A and uh, figure two, alternative site B. Section 1.3, Purpose Function, page 2, section 4.4, Project Performance, Downstream Benefits, page 15. It's clear that a key purpose of this off-channel storage project involves peak flow reductions and associated flood damage reduction on the Black River, Red Lake River, and Red River of the North. However, the report does not provide much information about the scope of local flood damages that would be reduced by this project. It's also not clear where Sherrick Dam on the Black River is located and how the project would improve an operation of the Sherrick Dam. Presumably the second benefit to maintain the tax base involves the plans to purchase flowage easements and allow continued farming of 250 acres within the upper pool area of the impoundment. Is that correct? It's not completely clear. Section 3.2, Geology and Subsurface Soils, page 8. Subsurface and geotechnical exploration, which is reportedly planned, and design analysis would be very important for the impoundment embankment design and drainage design. Section 3.3, Fish, Wildlife, Ecologically Sensitive Resources. Page 9, subsection B, Existing Water, Wetland Resource Impacts and Potential Mitigation. Indicates that less than 0.1 acres of wetlands will be impacted due to the construction footprint of the proposed dike and interior ditch. It is not clear what impacts will occur for the project. Uh, more actions are planned for the total of 5.59 acres of wetlands within the impoundment area, identified in Appendix D, Field Wetland Inventory Report, Proposed Impoundment Site, Appendix E, Aquatic Resource Delineation Report, Diversion Ditches, indicates a total of 23.16 acres in 17 wetlands within and or adjacent to the proposed diversion ditches. In Section 3.3b, indicates that these wetlands will be temporarily impacted by construction of the improved diversion ditches and reintroduced after construction is complete. I presume that the project team and the design team will appropriately address these wetland impacts in the final design and documentation. <clears throat> Section 4.2 Hydrology, a hydrology model of basin, pa of basin, page 11. The report indicates that the hydrology focuses on project is on summer rainfall events which is the greatest potential to affect agricultural production. The report doesn't define the effects of the project toward the Red River Basin's goal of 20% reduction of peak flows and volume during the flood comparable to 1997 spring snow melt. Section 4.3, Hydraulic Design of Flood Control Structures, Bees, Principal Spillway, page 14. It might be helpful to explain why maximizing benefits 
for event, events of equal to or less than 10 year events was the priority. Section 6, alternatives considered, page 2. I wouldn't find this information more helpful if located earlier in the report. If you have any questions about this advisory report, please contact and it goes on the telephone number and his name. Sincerely, Al M. Kane, professional engineer, chief engineer. That's one. You want to tell me to read something? <laughs> <laughs> I'll read this one. So. so this report is the advisory report from Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. This is the commissioning advisory report for the Black River Empowerment Project, Red Lake Watershed District 176. Mr. Jesby. Thank you for the opportunity to review the preliminary engineer's report for Black River Empowerment Project 176. On behalf of the Commission of the Department of Natural Resources, I offer the following comments on the preliminary engineer's report for the above cited project in according to Minnesota Statute 103D 711. Advisory report response is 103D 711 subdivision 5. DNR finds that the document is substantially complete in relation to requirements of 103D 711 subdivision 2 subject to the following comments and recommendations. The, en the engineer's report is approved as practical. The soil's information provided views to be adequate for alternative analysis and preliminary design. Soil borings are noted on completed. Soil borings are noted on being completed in October in the preliminary report. Please submit the soil borings with the final engineer's report. General comments. Some of the there are some pieces of information that, that would enhance the need for the project if documented in the engineer's report. Provide a map showing the flood damages to the Black River watershed. It is mentioned in section 1.3, purpose function, that the report will reduce flood damages, but there's no map of documentation in the report that shows where the damages are occurring and how often then and to what events. Three new diversion ditches are noted in the report, but size of the ditches are not documented. We recommend that the diversion ditches, size, sizes are documented in the report. Inlet ditches and outlet ditches are also not cited in the report. We recommend it to include the size of the ditches so impacts to the environment can be assessed. Natural resource NREs are not mentioned in the report. In the watershed planning on enhancing the NRE benefits for the impoundment, i.e. moist soils, timing of water release for waterfowl nesting. If the watershed issue is planning on NREs, we recommend that they are listed in the report. Thank you for your consideration on these comments. Dean, I look forward to working with the Red Lake Watershed District on this project. If you have any questions regarding these comments, please contact Stephanie Clamap and it gives her email address and telephone number. Sincerely, Nathan Kessner, Regional Manager. That's it? That's it. <laughs> Go faster this time for some reason. Anybody care to have that read again or anything? <laughs> okay, at this time, I think, Tony, I'll have you do your engineer report. Sure. So those that don't know me, I'm Tony Norby with uh, Houston Engineering here in town. Um, I'm going to present you the engineer's report and kind of overview of the project and uh, and uh, some discuss some of the diversion ditch ideas and things like that here moving forward. Um, just give you guys an idea. Most of you probably know where we're at here, but Fever Falls is here, Saint Hilaire is here. We're about eight miles west of Saint Hilaire, is where um, the South Side Road is where we're proposing the impoundment site for the Black River Project. Um, just to give you a little bit of background here. Um, how, how this project all kind of come about was um, the, the the whole Red River Basin on the Minnesota side um, that were were members of the Red the Red Board, the Red River Watershed Management Board. Um, about four or five years ago, had an expanded distributed attention strategy study done. Um, that, that involved um, reducing uh, peak flows to the Red River by 20% um, in each, each uh, watershed district. Um, so those members there looked into doing that. Um, so at the beginning, there was four alternatives that were discussed when the, the, the district decided to kind of pursue this uh, avenue of this project. Um, there was on-channel on sites that were looked at, off-channel sites. Um, this, this site seemed to have the, the best storage capabilities and then also uh, willingness from landowners. So um, this site was ultimately the one that the district looked to pursue on. Uh, Houston Engineering, we got involved. Um, at that point with further engineering investigation and then the selection of that alternative. Um, 
the Red Lake Watershed District did go ahead, um, purchase land and flow, flow easements on the impoundment site back in June of 2017. Um, um, roughly, I'm not going to get into acres, but roughly about half and half, half they bought and half was uh, flow easement. Um, this, this is just more of a zoomed in uh, area of, of the project, um, the impoundment site here. It's hard to see these yellow, but we got yellow lines where these diversion ditches are, are going up here. Um, this, this was the original kind of layout of the project. Um, I know in that one report Myra read, they talked that we kind of did a hybrid of that one alternative. Well, to start with, we were looking at about 14.4 square miles of drainage area, which is the black boundary here. Um, and through project team meetings and landowner meetings, um, it was discussed then to ultimately go to this design um, where we continued this ditch up further north, capturing about a, an additional 2.4 square miles of drainage area um, to ult ultimately bring down to the impoundment site. Um, folks up in this area were, were concerned this water currently wants to run west and then hook in here and get into the Black River this way. Um, and there was there's already concerns that, that, that water pressure certain times of year is, is, is bad enough here where we thought if we could capture some of that water, bring it south into the pond site, we're maximizing our drainage area um, and also helping some of those folks to the west as well. Um, so through those meetings, this was ultimately the alternative, the hybrid alternative that got moved forward. <clears throat> so what are some of the benefits of this project? Um, we've reduced flood damage within the Black River Sub watershed, uh, local public transportation facilities, um, erosion to agricultural land, also private lands upstream and downstream um, of, the, of the site, um, improve efficiency of the downstream Shirk Dam um, by, by being able to hold water here within this site um, and allow for, for more storage within the Shirk Dam as well um, for, very, for large, large scale <coughs> flooding events. Uh, we're contributing to the Red River 20% uh, reduction strategy. We're enhancing existing upland and aquatic habitat, waterfall um, diversity, water quality. Um, one, one thing that, that was mentioned through the, the district is performed studies also on water quality um, where the, the Black River is impaired for dissolved oxygen is one thing. Um, in this project, granted we can't provide water probably all summer, but there's parts of summer where Black River actually dries up um, to where we'll be able to provide kind of a low flow augmentation to, to the Black River uh, for a longer duration of this project after peaks have subsided downstream. And then uh, one other caveat uh, that, that the district's looking at for this project is, is wetland banking. It's kind of outside the, the original scope of the project, but uh, it's something um, we're looking to pursue and, and, and try to take advantage of and kind of make money worthwhile there with wetland making site. Um, so preliminary engineer's report, um, I'll get into uh, a few things here. Uh, land use, I just wanted to, to share this with you. Uh, I got some statistics kind of here for the whole Red Lake Watershed District wide. Um, about 32% is A, cultivated crops. Um, you know, with, with upper and lower Red Lake and, and, and the river systems and things like that, they do have almost 42% that they have a, that's a water or a wetland base. Um, and you got some forest and, and some other ones there. But just to kind of compare with, with the 16.8 square mile uh, drainage area of the Black River site, um, here you're looking at just over 70% egg land um, to where you got just under 13% water and wetland. So, we are looking at a pretty heavily uh, agricultural area here um, for, for, for this project. Um, one thing I know over, over the last five, ten years, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the agency folks have, have talked about when, when you start looking at these types of projects to, to not only look on state land and things like that, but, but public or private property as well. Um, some of the hydrology, kind of the summary, we looked at multiple uh, durations of, of events when we started doing modeling for the site. Um, just to give you guys some ideas here, 100 year, 100 year 24 hour storms over a 24 hour period, 100 year uh, synthetic rainfall event 
um, would be about 6.2 inches of, of, of rain over that entire drainage area, 16 point square, or 16.8 square mile drainage area. Um, we looked at the 10 day, um, the 4 day, I'll get into some of the detail there, but then also snow melt uh, runoff was, was another thing that we looked at. Um, some of the characteristics or the project design, um, the embankment is uh, set at 1023.5, the top height in the uh, 1988 data. Um, top width will be 12 feet wide. Interior slope will be 5 to 1 on the, on the wet side. Exterior will be a 4 to 1. Um, spillways, there's, there's going to be a, a main or a principal spillway um, in, the, in the southwest corner. <laughs> I'll have a concrete riser pipe on it, and then a 60-inch, uh, ultimately a, a concrete pipe with a gate on the on the bottom. So we'll be able to uh, to control the, the inflow and the outflow, um, and then an, an emergency spillway or auxiliary spillway they call it um, will be a, an earthen spillway, kind of on the upper end. That's going to be a little bit lower than the rest of the, the embankment height um, for emergency uh, purposes. Um, storage, storage wise, you're looking gated storage up to about 1019, uh, which is about 3,000, just over 3,000 acre feet of storage. Um, so up to 10, 1019, you'll have the ability to close the gate and store everything up to that 1019 mark. Once we get over 1019, um, we have on gated storage up to about 1020.5 is where that emergency spillway would be. Um, but in between there, for about 900 acre feet of storage, um, we'd have the ability to, to hold, but we're going to be in that riser, there's going to be water spilling over the top of that riser and then uh, going out the 60, metering out the 60 feet <coughs> pipe. Um, the, the diversion ditch itself, um, the diversion ditches are based on a 10 year uh, design um, that kind of follows the mediation agreement. Um, back in 1997-98 that was put together in a, a new ditch design. So that was followed. We used that. We're using about 10 foot bottom width on the ditches and, and 4 to 1 four to one slopes. Um, here's just kind of a typical section of that dike itself. We got the 12 foot, 12 foot top width, um, 5 to 1 interior slope, 4 to 1 exterior slope. Um, there is a little bit. Um, we got the geotech uh, uh, work done, soil warnings, things like that. Um, so there is going to be a little bit of settlement that we're going to have to build in, especially in the west end where we're uh, getting into higher embankments and things like that. Um, also, there, there's some topsoil stripping that will be done out there, and then some subgrade preparation work um, where we're going to be excavating out. Um, about one to three feet depending on the height of the dam and then compacting and drying and bringing that material back in so we don't get uneven, uneven settlement throughout the, the, the section of the dike. Um, here's that principal spillway or that primary outlet that I was talking about where we got 60 inch pipe through the bottom with this concrete riser here. Um, and this is that 1019 mark where I was talking to you. We, we'll be able to, there'll be a gate right inside of here. It's not shown here, but there'll be a gate here where that can be closed and we'll be able to hold water up to this 1019. And then between here and, and up to here is where I was talking about that on gated storage. So uh, where water would start spilling, spilling into the principal spillway and then going out the pipe. So this will be in the outlet down in the southwest corner of the development site. Um, your typical section kind of of, uh, of, of those diversion ditches, um, I just took kind of one location within the plan and here and kind of trying to zoom in to show you what's going on. So if you imagine this is the center of a road, it could be County Road 68, it could be Passat 12, uh, any, any of the roads out there, it's all going to kind of mimic the same kind of design here. But we're coming off the road, con continuing the 4 to 1 slope that's currently there, going a little bit deeper, you got a 10 foot bottom, 4 to 1 back slope. Um, this top width kind of varies depending on how much spoil is in that area and we are trying to maintain a profile out here so we are, you know, our spoil is lower than our road top. And then a real gradual back slope off the back um, for most cases where we'll be allowing, uh, farmers will be farming this, farming this back slope again once the project's done. Um, here's kind of a more zoomed out 
detail kind of showing where existing right of way is currently, um, and then our new permanent right of way and temporary right of way. Um, this is probably an area where we have less spoil. There is going to be some places where the spoil is probably going to come out and then tie back in out in this area, where I was saying that you, you farmers would then turn <coughs> this again once the project is, is constructed. And we will have a grass a grass strip then on the off the 16 and a half feet off the top of the spoil there. Um, some of the hydraulics um, behind this, I was telling you about uh, different designs, different durations that we run. Uh, we run synthetic events, two through the 100 year, um, and, and then looked at what, what this site's going to be able to handle in, in those types of events. So just to kind of pick on the 100 year, 100 year events here, we got the 100 year 24 hour duration, the 100 year 4 day, and then down here the 100 year 10 day. Um, and through this process, um, depending on timing, a lot of times smaller drainage areas, it seems like you know the 24 hour is kind of the more um, drastic, higher peak flow. Um, just because of the smaller drainage area, you have that 24 hour period, the water is all coming and getting to that spot. Um, for this one, it's just it's kind of an in-between site as far as a large drainage area, small drainage area, to where the four day is actually um, where you see the highest peak. Um, so with that being said, a uh, 100 year four day uh, rainfall event for this area would be about 7.7 .7 inches of rain over that entire 16.8 square mile drainage area. Of that, obviously some of that is going to saturate into the ground and never make it to our, our impoundment site. But the runoff from that site through our modeling shows that we'll be able to hold, there will be nothing coming out in that 100 year four day event. So we'll be able to hold um, all that water within our gated storage of our impoundment site. And it'll be about a half a foot from going over that principal spillway and, and going into that rising pipe. Um, that's that, that's operating with the impoundment empty at that time. So that would be, you know, typical of like a spring, a spring where it where it's empty, emptied out in the fall. The next spring comes along, and you have this large event, and, and those are some of the characteristics of that. I'm um, just kind of show you that in a footprint here. These are 24-hour events, but uh, kind of give you the idea. Um, dark blue would be your five-year. Um, the lighter blue is a 10-year. 25-year is yellow. Um, dark blue would be your five-year. Um, the lighter blue is a 10-year. 25-year is yellow. 50-year, or sorry, a 100-year. 100 years is the orange one, and then the red is showing you where our riser would be at that 1019, so that's the maximum gated storage we have. You can see it on a five year, it looks like, yeah, man, this site's really filling out fast, but um, the site topography here is, is fairly flat through this area, but then once you can see all these lines tighten up, it really it really climbs here as you, if you enter up towards the, the ridge here of, of where the Black River Road is here for the Black River Church. So. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of some of the hydraulics on that. Um, downstream impacts, uh, downstream reductions, I should say, um, for, the, for the project. We, we looked at four locations here, even just on the Black River itself. And just try to zoom in so you can see some of this stuff a little better. So where we're dumping, our, our outlet ditch here is going to dump back into the Black River here. Um, I'll pick on the 100 year event again. Across the board, we have the 24 hour here, four day, and 10 day events. You can see roughly about a 24% reduction on peak flows um, to the Black River at that location. So, our project is going to reduce, in those 100 year events, our project is going to reduce the peak flows by about 24% where we're dumping our project back into the Black River. Uh, if we go a little bit further downstream, um, just upstream of where the Browns Creek enters uh, the Black River. Here, there again, if we pick on the 100 year, you can't see it on your screen, but I can see it here. It's about 19, 18 to 19% across the board for those three uh, durations. Uh, and then if we, if we go a little bit down, further downstream, down at the Sheer Dam, where the, the Browns Creek is also coming in uh, to, the, to the Black River system, here you're, you're, you're at about 11, 10 to 11% for those 100 years. And then the last one we looked at is right uh, upstream of the confluence with the Red Lake River. 
and you're at about six, seven percent for those for those events coming up hundred years. So it does show that there is some peak uh, peak flow reduction downstream, um, helping out those folks as well. Um, cost for this project, um, the district has already, uh, like I said earlier, um, purchased and then also got flow adjustments on the impoundment site itself. Um, so that 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 has been paid for. Uh, so we got land acquisition. One other land acquisition easements that we are going to have to look at is easements for these diversion ditches, both temporary and permanent. Uh, and I'll get into that here a little bit more as well. Um, and then construction costs, you know, engineering, environmental, permitting, um, utilities. There is some power out there um, that we're going to have to deal with as well. Um, you're looking at a total cost here of, of approximately about eight million bucks. Uh, project funding and financing for this. Um, typical projects like this through state dollars um, is usually broke up somewhat in this similar fashion. I'll have it on the screen. Um, half, usually about 50% of the project we would go after through the state's flood damage reduction program, uh, which would be about four million. Um, the remaining 50% then gets broke up about two thirds, one third between Red River Watershed Management Board and then the Red Lake Watershed District, um, leaving about 2.67 million to the Red Board and about 1.33 million then to the Watershed District. At this point in time, uh, funding through the flood damage reduction stuff through the state has not, uh, not been secured yet. Um, we are working on that um, and, and talking to those folks at, as, as we speak. So um, we're hoping to move forward with with getting, getting those partners involved. Um, kind of an update of where, where we're kind of currently at right now. Um, like I say, the preliminary engineer's report is complete. Uh, comments, Myron just read those from the DNR and Bowser. Um, we've submitted, there's a three-step process for submitting for funding through the Red River Watershed Management Board. Um, we've done two of those three. Um, so once once we kind of get these permits and things like that wrapped up, we'll be submitting that third one for the funding. Um, final plans, I would say, are approximately 90, probably even close to 95% complete. Um, just kind of waiting on a few things there. Permitting, we've submitted uh, to the Corps of Engineers. We've uh, submitted to the local WACA folks for the wetlands. Um, we're waiting on a response there. We'll do that in June this year. Uh, we submitted to the DNR for dam safety here back in July. We've received some initial comments there. Um, we've been doing some back and forth there as well. Um, the wetland banking portion, um, we've started started that. We've, we've sent out the, the first document, uh, scoping document for that. Got some comments back and now we're working back and forth there as well. Um, and starting to kind of some preliminary uh, description of our design. Um, so with that, recommendations, uh, establishment of the Black River Empowerment Project will provide uh, flood damage reduction both downstream and technically upstream a little bit too, um, and natural resource benefit. Um, engineering, design, and information available finds the project is feasible and recommends the Watershed District take the necessary steps to continue development of the project and move forward. Um, so with that, I don't know if we want to stop here and see if the board has any questions. I just had a comment. When you showed that, yeah. that cross section of those uh, diversion ditches, you showed the spoil. You know, you should have explained to the landlords how they're going to be able to drain their fields. Decided that so, yep. So, wherever there currently is a, 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 a field ditch entering those ditches, um, we will have spoil there, but we will be also putting in sidewater inlet pipes. So there will be a 18, 24, um, I think even a couple cases we've sized for 30 inch, but there'll be pipes that'll allow that flow off the field to, to get enter the ditch. And ultimately the reason for those those pipes is to trap sediment and keep that on the field instead of having that enter our to the ditch system. Uh, now, okay. Tony, can you address how if the project moves forward, how would it would affect JD twenty five three as yeah, far as so all that I got, portion? I got some more uh, discussion here about the easements and things like that as well. Um, so diversion ditch 
easement damages, um, I'll maybe touch on that first. Um, we have not pursued yet for, for easement, like I say, for constructing these, these ditches. Um, what we kind of looked at, there's about 12 miles of these uh, diversion ditches, approximately about 92.7 acres of, of permanent right-of-way, permanent easement, I should say, that, that we would be looking at purchasing. Um, and then also about 80.5 acres of temporary uh, construction easement where we would use that for stripping topsoil, spoil piling, stuff like that. And then, you know, once construction's done, that, that property would be back to farmers um, and they would have the sole right of that. Um, the permanent easement, um, what we're looking at proposing right now is kind of using the taxable market value. value. Um, currently in the year 2018, um, the highest taxable market value out there for agricultural land is about $3,200 an acre. Um, the lowest was about $1,225 per acre. Um, building sites or areas where there's some tax exempt properties out there, we were looking at probably using highest uh, adjacent property taxable value. So, um, whatever that neighboring agricultural land is going from, whichever one's higher is kind of what we're looking at. Um, temporary construction damages that we're looking at uh, is about $300 an acre. Um, we usually do those damages based on a two year period of, of loss of agricultural production. So it'd be te technically it'd be 150 bucks each year, but it's usually just paid in a one lump sum chunk. And if you can farm it the next year, great, but sometimes the, the quality or your production rate is probably a little bit a little bit low so that's why we do that over that two year period um, as far as benefits go um, maybe this is probably what you're looking for John, right, a little bit um, benefits go um, for assessing of a maintenance for, for the for the diversion ditches uh, I guess I should touch first off uh, the impoundment site and the outlet ditch um, we're looking at the, the district would cover any kind of maintenance involved in the, in, in the impoundment itself and the, the outlet ditch. Um, but the diversion ditches, they're looking to set up some sort of maintenance assessment uh, moving forward. So down the road, um, these ditches can be maintained, mowed, um, any kind of sediment that gets in them that can be cleaned, things like that. So um, with that, we've broken them up into four different uh, areas, I, I guess I'd call them, area one, area two, and area three, and area four. Um, area one is in red, um, and that would be assessed at the highest, the higher value, just because you're right, pretty much right next to the, to the ditch system. Area two would be the, the blue portion here, where, where you're close, but you're a little bit further away, and then area three would be this yellow, this yellow portion here. Um, you're a little bit further away even yet. And then area four is unfarmed wetlands, which are all these, they're kind of hard to see here, but they're the light blue color on here. Um, so those would be assessed even at a lower value. And right now, what we were looking at, um, maximum yearly assessment of approximately 75,000 for the entire, would be the entire system. Um, so with that, let's say 20 years down the road, the, the district has some issues out there and needs to do some sort of repair on the, on the ditch system. They need to have funds to, to do that. Um, so if, if that was the case and they were doing the maximum uh, 75,000, 75, you'd be looking at area one about $9.50 per acre assessment. Uh, area two, seven, well, $7.13, area three, seven or four, 4.75 and then area four, about well, 1.78 per acre. Typical years, um, you know, the first probably 20, 20 years, there isn't gonna be a whole lot of maintenance because it's gonna be a brand new ditch, um, nice side slopes, things like that, to where more of just a mowing cost is probably the, the, the expenses that would happen for the ditch system, to where you're looking at probably more of a, a neighborhood of a $10,000 assessment. Um, at that point, you look in those areas, you know, area one, about a buck 20 per acre, area two, about 90 cents, area three, about 60 cents, and then area four, about 23 cents. Um, so just kind of looking at that again, these, these are the area ones, area twos, 
area is three, and then the, the wetland area was area four. So does that kind of cover covering what you were? Yeah. Or where is the existing JD 25-3 portion? So the existing JD 25-3 portion would be, well, technically it comes in down here and it comes along this stretch here and it comes up and into this, this area. So that, that would also be included if, if the, the county were to go ahead and, and do the abandonment, that portion of the ditch we would be looking to assess, I guess, as part of this project and become, become uh, part of the ditch system with our diversion ditches. And then with that, all future maintenance would just be tied in with this project? Correct. Um, should be noted too on the maximum of that 75,000, say they had to replace some culverts in 25 years or whatever, and if we had to um, actually maintain the system and, and charge the maximum of that 75,000, that wouldn't be a one lump sum payment per year. It would probably be prorated over a few years to be determined by the board. So that number would be a maximum per, for that property but would be typically strung out over a few years time. Right, so, you usually see those maintenance issues coming multiple, couple of years ahead of time. Anyway. Yeah. Please, please call for one and things like that, where you can kind of rev it up instead of just going from here up to here and going in one year. Okay. Is that it for me? Yeah, that's about all I have. Okay, uh, I think now we'll open it up for either questions for probably the abandonment procedure first. Uh, we, do, we did have one letter that was stated. Uh, we did have a letter from Greg Halston that had it been noted in our records. And it's on record and on the calendar. Yeah. Well, if anybody from the public wants to read it, it's available and yeah. it's also been made available to each of the board members. Yeah, it should be noted too, there has been various landowner meetings for this project in advance of these hearings. Yes, the majority of the landowners were in, intertwined with this pretty regularly. I guess we'll take any questions from uh, any engineering questions, any costs, uh, anything of that nature now too. So the Everybody's pretty satisfied over there. Yeah. Future maintenance assessment outline there so anything that was in that outline will become benefited area for the, or thinking anyway for the new system so anything of that that's in 25-3 now would be taken out right that's and that would be upon the completion of the project so nothing would happen until the project would be because not all of that is in 25-3 that's why it was on so anything that was in 25-3 is not in that section i guess one other thing to note too is is if Especially for if, if you're farmers out there, if, if you're anywhere along some of these, I guess, lines, Grant, I know everything wants to go west, but if you're kind of right on that adjacent edge and you're looking to get drainage, if, if this project moved forward and you were looking to get drainage for something to go back east, um, it would be good, I think, to have discussion with you folks because if we don't have you get in now, um, and you come in, let's say, five, ten years from now after the project is established and say, hey, I'd like to drain into that. If you're not currently in the benefited area, you will we'll have to then petition into um, the benefited area to get in. So I guess... And then there's, then there's fees for advertising and stuff. So right, get back into the right. System. So I guess just to let that know now, if, if you're thinking to maybe change any of your drainage patterns, um, that would be good to know. And we don't have to discuss that today either, but I mean, it's good to know and talk to Myron or, or someone too, so. Ray, did your concerns get addressed? I have another question uh, regarding the uh, areas there. For example, that first area, the red. Uh, what acres, what figures do you use to determine what the, the cost is going to be? Is it going to be the entire acreage of the farm in that unit? Or is it only, for example, if we have half woods and half tilled acres, we pay the 
maximum price on the entire farm, or you pay part of the benefit. Yeah, right. The tier one for the tillable and tier four for the non-tillable yeah. wetland or whatever. Or how do you come up with that figure? Good question. I can kind of answer that from a viewer standpoint. Um, so what viewers look at is they look at wetland number one. Um, wetlands, and Tony has some of them listed there. Wetlands are protected, you know, where you really can't, you know, probably farm them anymore with the new wetland laws. However, when you look at woods, um, viewers always look at it that that's the land use type. And if you, you know, there's woods knocked out all the time that can get into hay. So instead of, quantifying every acre of woods that's out there, you look at it just as an overall, and, if, and so that will give you cleared 60 acres of woods next year, we don't have to go back and readdress or re, uh, re determine the benefits now that you would get 60 acres of wood. But it's kind of per parcel. Yeah, right? but it is, it is on a per parcel basis, so we don't differentiate between the woods and agricultural land um, from a what standpoint of the viewing. Pardon me? What about wetlands? Wetlands are, and that's what Tony had mentioned. You see all these wetlands that are that we've listed. That's only from the NWI, National right. Wetland Inventory Map. Yeah. We don't know on your FSA, which is some of that's confidential, so the, we don't have access to that. So all we can use when we look at land use is what's uh, from the state, and that's National Wetland Inventory Map. So that's all we can use, and that's all we have. If you have any additional wetlands, and you see that they aren't identified on here, get a hold of us and we can put them in this document. Um, but we don't we don't have access to that information. This is just a bit of guessing in a way to it. It's only until we have viewers and whatnot to establish that. Thank you. We don't have to have any viewers, so this is the established price. No. We may expand some of these you know of the benefits based on landowners' requests. Right. If they know they want to bring their water to these new ditches. And I think um, that we have some concerns earlier joining some in from the northern end. And then just to bear, you know, this here area here that, you know, Tony put in a lower rate is simply because this system is not being uh, the, uh, constructed to what these are. So they still have slightly less um, benefit based on a flow rate. However, their outlet has increased dramatically for the water that comes here. Um, and this gives them an opportunity to have more, if they ever wanted to improve this area, that would leave some extra cost there for the landowners that have land up in that area to be able to uh, still get the same ditch as everyone else and then pay the same amount in the end of the day if they ever wanted to increase that flow. Any other questions? Yeah, thanks, Watson. Uh, I have a question about the uh, we talked about the outlets, and we talked about the ditch system and how efficient they are in collect water. But I live right across from the inlet, <coughs> and uh, and I'm very concerned about how that water is going to come in there. And because I have potential, I have flooding every year in my road. My driveway gets flooded out, so that needs to be addressed. And you know, I to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yeah, and I know you have. I think you have some some side inlets for a ditch that comes across here that we're looking to get inside the pipes and things like that to spoil. And then also now this ditch will be improved um, coming in here as well. And then there'll be a large large box culvert that'll go through the highway now and take all that water into the. Into which the side box. of the high, Which side of the um, my driveway will that be? The, west side? the east. East side. East side. Yep. Okay. East side of my driveway. Yep. How, how far? Out? How far? Um, off the top of my head, I I'd have to look at the plan. I got the plan here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know we've addressed this concern for oh, a right, right. I don't know if you're going to go that was something we were quite concerned over. Okay, so there's box culvert coming in. Where? What's the location? For the box culvert? It'll be just east of your your driveway coming in at an angle from the north to oh. south. In so it'll go um, a diagonal across there? Yep. Oh. Yep. Because, and then what will happen to uh, the <coughs> ditch? Well, I don't know. Like, 
number is, but you can go the one that follows three and then go step left directly down to the Black River. Yeah, what will happen to that one? That's kind of still up for discussion a little bit. Okay, because that, that ditch, that's where, my, that's where if there's any spillway or any extra damage that's going to occur, it will it'll block, it it'll won't go through the uh, my culvert by the driveway, and it'll go down the, that ditch and it'll flood out my farmstead. So that, yeah, that ditch west, as you're talking here, west of the incumbent side on the north side of the road now, the only the only water that should be going to that now is going to be the local runoff from the drainage area just just north of the road. So is that so going to all, be all the water upstream of that is going to be diverted into the impoundment site? Oh, so that'll be flood. Well, it'll 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 still be there oh. to the river. Um, but, but but the driveway the driveway culvert going across my going entering into my driveway will be flood, which will force the water to stop there. Right. And back up into my farmstead. Well, it, it technically shouldn't now that, that the tent, the design of the ditch and the design of the culvert should allow that. And there should be no tailwater really allowing backwater from the impoundment site. It should just be flowing into the impoundment site. So um, it should be a lot better situation than you have now. It's got to be an off the big box culvert. Yeah, yeah. All of, all a, what your frequency is that box culvert design now? Uh, that was probably designed for uh, 50 years because it depends on the the yeah, so right oh, yeah, how we are flood event and I, my farm's dead. Well, anything after a 50 year event, um, yeah. right now you probably have protection for a tree. And now you're going to have 50. Yeah. That's, that's the reality. That's what that ditch system is designed for about a three year frequency. So that's quite a. Charles uh, I'm in that blue area there, uh, south of Center Street, Section 2, and I have a culvert that goes across uh, on the very west side of that blue area to the Judicial 25. And uh, the way it is right now, when Judicial 25 is draining to the west, water builds up on my side to the south of Center Street. And it goes out, and then when 25 lowers down to a certain point, then it will drain out. Is that still going to be the same situation, or what? So, to, um, so Charlie, you right now, again, like it just will create that ditch system is designed for like a three year frequency. You're going to have a 10 year frequency okay. on that ditch now. So, you're going to have three times the capacity in 25 3 than you had before, which should really minimize water building up other than maybe the culvert flood by snow. Um, but you should have, you know, three times the uh, drainage that you had before. See, right so now that culvert is not dated or anything. Yeah. And it, it's free flowing. So when the water level in 25 goes down far enough, then it's scheduled to flow off. Yeah, it which it does. Yeah. But in the meantime, yes. it takes quite a while before that, that's the case. Yep, it, it freezes up and fills up with snow. That culvert's going to fill up with snow and it's going to plug, and all the water is going to flow everywhere. Right, but uh, but in your case, that box culvert is probably not going to freeze up. It's not going to be full. Well, I know, my, I know that big old culvert by my driveway fills up all the time. Remember, that's a three year culvert versus a 50. Because uh, the box still snow plugs it up in the spring, and that's where I get my flooding. I just looked at the proposed box cover, it's 14 feet wide by 7 feet high. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. My, the one going under the road is uh, probably, I don't know, maybe 12 feet wide by uh, 8, 6 feet high. So the one two by 62. Yeah. And that floods up well, solid with snow and ice. And nobody comes out, clears it out, and the driveway floods. Washes out. It literally washes out. One other thing, too, when you're improving these di additional ditches now, and you add some more drainage area there, the water's going to come a lot faster to the south <coughs> into yes. the impoundment than it ever did before. Yeah, it never went there before. So, so we're going to have flooding, more flooding there. Is that going to be... Uh, Taken into consideration, or are you going to have some 
some rock dams in the ditch or something uh, periodically to slow the water down or what? There actually is rock checks along this whole system. Yep. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of fall in the <coughs> land out here. Um, currently in the ditch systems that are there, there's no there's, there's nothing that I know where there's some rock structures where you just pretty much got a down plane going on right now where our design now is going to include more of a, a flatter slope and then step it down with a rock system okay. and then, then flatten again and then step it down again. So I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think there's 30 some rock drops in these 12 miles. Okay. So that's going to slow the flow down uh, drastically compared to what the, the fast and slopes and They are designed for erosion and for yeah. volume. One other question. Uh, east of me there, there's uh, up by where the hog farm is. Uh, there's very highly erodible area of soil in there. Um, I know the county, we've, they've had trouble for years with the, with the north side of that one road. Uh, I forget what county road it is. But anyway, what are they going to do for that uh, highly erodible area? Is that going to be a culvert under there or what is that going to be? Well, there'll be, there'll be some open cut there, but there's going to be culvert into the into the property there um, and then also some uh, erosion stabilization rock structures and, and things like that in the bottom and uh, we've even got I think we're blanketing that portion too so not just seeding and mulching we're actually until that vegetation get established we're going to have some blanket erosion control blankets and things like that there because if you don't they're going to you could lose part of that road right you know. Yeah, so the, the, I think the original plan, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's like almost two to one slope over there. Uh, this would be a four to one slope right. on the off the road township or off the county road would be a four to one with a yeah. ten foot bottom and a four to one back slope. Right now it's like this. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's gonna be sloped back, which will minimize the erosion. Any other questions? Well, I just want to make sure that that culvert gets clean in the spring because I'm not, that's the only time during the snow melt season, there has to be some language in there where they're going to be coming out there and cleaning out that culvert. Well, we'll definitely be responsible for the project once it's well, put into place. I don't, I don't know unless it's in writing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I farm over by Kirsten, you live in Grand Forks, and, and I, I farm around three of these projects. I wasn't on the board when I started these projects, and I have the same questions and the same concerns. And I opened my mouth, and that's how I got out of the board. And then, uh, <laughs> county commissioners. Anyway, we, we go out with that. If, 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 if there's a problem issue, and then we've had problems on Euclid East where there was an inlet that comes in on the south side. I don't know what we're talking about. There was an issue there where the water was over, it was coming faster than, than we thought it would. So we fixed that. That's, that's the idea. You know, we don't make this and walk away. You know, we, we, we continue to listen to their concerns and fix it. That's just my opinion. I have one other question if I may. What is the overall cost of benefit ratio on this project? The $8 million versus how many years of benefits uh, in the valley and so forth? Does anybody have an answer on that or not? For what the funding we're looking at for the state, uh, the cost benefit analysis, you don't have to do that, per se. Um, federal dollars, uh, sometimes there you, you got to look at and try to, to get the one to one. So, yeah, that is not you know, been looked at down to the real details. You know, what what is a goose worth out on the county site or what a duck is worth, you know, for, for bio, all that kind of thing. So, Tony, can you also address the Sherrick Dam? Did you say there's about a 10% reduction? At the Sherrick Dam, what does that do? Yeah, so the Sherrick, at the Sherrick Dam, operation of this um, should lower now in a larger scale event, lower the elevation of the Sherrick Dam. So ultimately, then the Sherrick Dam has more storage capability for larger scale events. Um, we also looked at the timing of this. If we start, because the Sherrick Dam is operated solely off of what's happening downstream in Crookston, uh, to where this is going to be a more operated on a basis of what's coming in upstream, we're going to hold it and then wait till downstream subsides and then they'll slowly open the gate and release, release the water downstream. Um, so we looked at us 
just with that slow re re release, is that going to harm the operation of the shear cam itself? And um, from what we could find in our in our rating curves and our modeling, that that is not the case. Um, it's actually going to be a benefit, like say, to have the water levels lower, um, so the shear cam actually is going to have more room for storage than what it does currently. Typically, right, general, uh, on your previous projects, when you talk about the under your bed and all the rainfall, is that you had like 7.7 .7 inches or anything? Seven, I think it was seven two for the okay. 10 day. Okay. Is that, how does that fall in line with the other projects? I mean, is that from the average? Is it below or above? Or it's 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 pretty close. I mean, across the this whole kind of northwest area, um, Atlas. It's called Atlas 14. They they've actually for these synthetic events, two to a hundred year event, they've actually just recently made some modifications to those um, and actually increased them just because everyone around here seems to think too that you know the the five year event is no longer the five year event. It seems like nowadays, nowadays that's a two year event. So. There has been some slight increases in those uh, rainfall um, depths, and those are the ones we use for, for this model. Uh, Neil, I'm going to turn it over to you as far as if you have any more questions for your deal. And if you may want to close your portion of the area and turn it back over to us. If there's no more questions, I'll be that potential damage of this uh, <coughs> system. Is there any more questions? If not, we would ask for a motion to close our portion of the area. At that point, we declare this our portion of this hearing call. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions from the watershed point of view here as far as any questions? Anything? I think at this time, we'll go into our hearing as well. I'll be informational hearing to order for the county, and at this time, I'll turn it over to Chairman Neil Peterson. Yes, and our hearing today is for the eventual abandonment of a portion of JD3. Proper notice has been sent to all landowners affected in the JV3 system, either by mail or notice of the paper. And at this time, we'll turn it over to either Mike or Ken to give us a brief history of the ditch system. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm Mike Vlog, I'm the county engineer. Uh, do you want to we introduce the county staff here? That's, that's fine. Um, Ken, uh, I'm Ken Olson, I'm the county architect. Uh, Bruce Warren, County Commissioner, District 5. KSW, County Attorney. Neil Peterson, District 3. Don Jansen, District 1. Okay. So uh, what I'll do is, if we have about 50 minutes, we'll give a brief overview of the uh, proposal and some history behind Ditch 25-3. Is this the first slide? and then we'll go into the, the watershed's uh, information and then we'll have joint hearing at that point if your information from the public. Uh, a brief history of uh, County Ditch uh, JD25. Uh, County Ditch 25 was constructed in 1906 and later consolidated with JD25-3 in 1981. And then they also included a redetermination of benefits at that time. Uh, it's believed that the ditches were combined in means of to improve the efficiency and the maintenance and accounting of the entire system. Uh, purpose of the abandonment, uh, a portion of JD25-3 that's proposed to be abandoned includes the original County Ditch 25 system, that area. And I'll just jump to the here. So that area in green was the original County Ditch 25 benefited area, and you can see there's a you know, the, next slide. the next slide uh, kind of zooms in. So that yellow line is the existing ditch. 
the location of the ditch. And then we put a double line there in the area where we'll have further discussion on that stretch because that does not dump into the impoundment area. So whether that gets, yeah, right, that area right there. So whether that gets abandoned would be part of the discussion as well. So. Okay. So if the Black River Impoundment project moves forward, so the the purpose of the abandonment, um, the portion of J twenty five dash that is proposed to be abandoned, so it includes the original County Ditch twenty five system, which we just looked at. Uh, if the Black River Impoundment project moves forward, the original benefited area of County Ditch 25 that was in that green area would be paying two separate maintenance taxes. So one to the impoundment and one to 25-3. So the abandonment is being proposed to eliminate that redundancy. Um, so then I just have the maps. So the, the red line is the entire 25-3 benefited area. Um, it's tough to see, but there's a little light blue line that shows the 25-3 ditch system. And I can, so right through here is 25-3. It starts just just south of the cut across the Kasaf 3. And then it goes north. Cuts across this way, and then it splits. A portion of it goes up in here, and then another system goes up in here, up to about the county line. And then the other portion, which is the old county ditch 25, connects at just on the north side of 3, and it goes east on the north side of 3, and then there's about a mile that cuts across in the south side and it cuts back to the north side goes north for about two miles. So this is the portion where we're talking about possible abandonment. So that's my 15 minutes worth in five minutes. <laughs> I don't know if there's uh, too much more information. I don't can you, can you think of anything else?